Hey everyone, Eric Watson here, freelance writer, player of games, writer of words, recorder of videos, and tabletop role-playing aficionado. Welcome to another DM's Guild review, my written and video review series where I take a look at the adventures and supplemental material at the Dungeon Masters Guild website. For this video, I'll be reviewing the DM's Guild adventure, The City of Eyes, designed by Oliver Clegg for Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. A review copy has been provided for the purposes of this review. If you enjoy my videos, consider supporting me via patreon.com slash roguewatson. Shout out to platinum patrons Andrew, Brian, Richard, and Joe. Gold patrons RPG Papercrafts, Charming Grenade, Pretty Boy, and Yuma, Marcos, David, Vicente, Gilberto, Sean, aka Cert2B, and Adam. Thank you all very much for your support. My history with Ravenloft is not one. <laughs> I have read through uh, The Curse of Strahd. I reviewed the Roll20 module on a YouTube video. And that is about my extent of my Ravenloft knowledge. I also have no experience with tier, basically tier 3 or 4. Most of our D&D adventures end around 11 or 12. And that's really how a lot of the published adventures work. We're running a lot of the 5th edition published adventures. So when an adventure states that it is for 15th level adventurers, that really causes me to sit up and raise an eyebrow because I have no idea what to expect. So I don't have a lot of experience with Ravenloft and I have no experience for 15th level adventures. Let's put that out there. City of Eyes, if you can't tell by my setup, is a Ravenloft adventure for 15th level adventures. It's also over 100 pages. When Oliver sent this to me, he mentioned it was a doozy of a module. He was not kidding. I'm going to repeat that. Over 100 pages in this adventure. And it's damn good. It is damn good. It really scratches all the itches of a horror-themed adventure while also creating the perfect kind of framework that I like for a bigger module, which is give the players a area to free roam at, you know, an open world area, but limit that into a limited zone, which is a really bad way of trying to describe the fact that this is an urban adventure that takes place in a city that's specifically in one of those dark dimensions that Ravenloft takes place in, where just fucked up things can happen in this little dimension that you can't escape from. Uh, but within that city, you can go around to different areas and essentially have an adventure and explore all these things. Now, the main storyline, the through line through all of this is that you're, well, you're trying to escape uh, from Elysium, which is the City of Eyes. Uh, and in doing so, you can track down a, uh, a woman character who has been trying to research basically how to escape the city. Uh, you'll find different clues around the towns. So there's a neat mystery to be solved there. And then eventually it culminates in a giant uh, standoff with this ancient um, beating heart, which is manifested as this dark mirror uh, that is trying to escape its imprisonment and it has been sealed away and is kind of infecting this whole city. Uh, it's incredible. There's a ton of detail here. Um, I'm going to attempt to go through it, but I can't go through every single bit because we'll be here for an hour. Uh, and a part of me wants to do that, but I'm not going to do that. So let's try and go over uh, the City of Eyes as best as I can. But I really I really do love this adventure. Um, I just It's organized very, very well. It's, got, uh, it's organized into, into chapters, but each chapter is just a location. Um, and again, you're sort of meant to go in these areas, not necessarily in order, but there is a, th a through line, a thread that you can pick up starting at, uh, you know, you wake up in a bar, uh, classic trope, um, and it even says with the adventure hooks, and it's, and it's Ravenloft, so literally these mists of Ravenloft can just pick characters up anywhere, which is um, really great. Uh, and again, for 15th level, you know, really pick you up from whatever. In fact, I'm thinking, man, if I run this, I would pick, I would zap them into this area, like right after Tomb of Annihilation or something. It would just fit really well. But the Mists of Ravenloft pick them up, and they can drop them off uh, in the city. They wake up in a bar, and for the entire, I believe, two chapters, well, one chapter specifically, is just descriptions on what this city is. And there's a lot of really great details on how uh, madness works, on how there's a, a, an actual ticking clock to everything the characters do, which really reminded me of uh, the classic Arkham Horror board games, or uh, Elder Sign, or uh, Mansions of Madness, or any of those uh, really fun, cooperative, Cthulhu-based uh, board games. There's actually a ton of them. 
Uh, and they all have that kind of theme of um, racing against time to try to stop some sort of uh, ritual from being completed or some kind of um, eldritch horror, dark dimensional beast. And uh, they, and meanwhile, you have to worry about your health as well as your sanity, which is definitely a thing here. And then literally in game terms, you advance the hour every time the chimes toll. And different things happen, which is really thematic. So vermin can creep up from the city. Um, the fog will move in. Um, the, the storm gets worse. The dead begin to rise. The stars vanish from the night sky. Like All these things happen to really drive home the fact that the players are on this... Um, time frame that's you know pretty much up to the dm but it, it creates a nice like feeling of the walls are closing in on you this oppressive theme which is uh fantastic um that's throughout the prologue chapter one describes um elysium in general you can see there's some nice little artwork throughout um there is a map given although it does state that obviously you can change the city around not only can you change the city around but the city itself literally changes around it's constantly shifting and it's this um it reminds me of this, uh, oh, shoot, like a Alice in Wonderland kind of a theme, where it's just this, you know, ethereal um, area that's just constantly shifting and changing. What am I trying to think of? Some other movie that did that. Uh, or Dark City, maybe, where it's like literally like mechanics, you know, just people behind the scenes like moving shit around, um, which seems to work uh, very, very well here. This is all just setting up to who are the people here, uh, which it's very much reminds me of Curse of Strahd. It is a lot of Curse of Strahd stuff. Um, in terms of uh, the personality of the people, the fact that people don't talk about the evilness in the world. Um, it's written in a very creepy, fun way that's like you're not meant to talk. And there's like brownies that sneak in and, um, you know, make sure all the bakers have bread and everything else. There's no economy. There's no government. Like this whole world is just at this weird, like, um, you know, state of the present. There's no past and no future. But uh, the future is, you know, coming to an end, essentially. Uh, really, really nice thematic here. Uh, random encounters uh, throughout. One of my favorites is that a gray render, which, by the way, really good use of Mordenkainen's Tomb of Foes throughout here. Like, almost all of these enemies are found in Mordenkainen's, which uh, can be kind of detrimental if you don't have Mordenkainen's, but if you do, it uses them very well. Um, a gray render wants to play, uh, and literally just a monster just rolls a ball towards your feet, and it will just play with that character. Like, this horrible, like, CR, you know, whatever, 12, like, giant monstrosity will just play with the characters. Um, just really fun random encounters throughout, almost to where the author could have bundled up a lot of these random encounters and just made a, like, Ravenloft-themed random encounter book and sold it on the DMs Guild. Like, they're that good. There's too many to go over, but they're all, like, absolutely fantastic. It, also, if you were playing, like, an Arkham Horror game and you're just drawing a card and, and reading it aloud, like, that's what all of these are. These are very small ones, obviously, and then later on, uh, Chapter 2, I believe, the Penny Dreadful chapter is literally just uh, slightly bigger uh, random encounters, which are also all very, very good. I'm not going to go over every single one of these. Um, you can see there's the city. Each one of these letters, by the way, is a chapter and location that is detailed uh, throughout one of the chapters. So there is, let me see if I can go over my notes because it was extensive. I had to write down. Um, the Crooked House is the first place the player should end up with, which is a phenomenal haunted house that is full of, like, rugs of smothering and cloakers and mimics. There's a room full of cats that if you disturb one cat, they all attack you and they have the stat block of a tiger. Uh, just anything that can attack you will attack you in that house, which is great. And they're meant to find this duchess woman who's missing her daughter, and the daughter, Cecilia, is the woman who has essentially gone to every single location here um, in trying to research how to leave this place. And that's a really clever way of creating a uh, connective tissue between all the different locations and give an overarching mystery to the series. Although, there's a bit of a misstep here in that um, it kind of peters out. It doesn't end up like I was hoping Celeste, uh, Cecilia would end up being one of the gods at the end or some kind of extra character. And in fact, what ends up happening is it uses the uh, Curse of Strahd method of the tarot deck to randomly assign the location of and the location and the plot points of certain elements, which I actively dislike. I don't like that. Like it's fun thematically to sit there and deal your characters' cards out and all that. I get that, but from a DM's point of view, I don't want to leave a lot of that up to uh, chance. I just want to be able to pick and choose and place things where I think they would make the most fun uh, storytelling-wise. Uh, and, you know, in some cases, it's some of the, you know, best treasures could be found way easier or earlier than others, which could create a balancing issue. Um, 
the fact that Cecilia is a lot of times can be just killed somewhere and the players would never know about it seems incredibly anticlimactic considering that was the like one character they're tracking down and is their like main quest throughout the story. And then the final one that they can uh, that, that's randomly chosen is the uh, the motivation of one of the major NPCs, which is the spider god called Groblitz, uh, who spoiler alert was meant to um, seal uh, help seal away the evil that lies beneath the city, and he was the one um, god of Elysium that um, neglected his duties and ran away in cowardice, and that's why the evil is breaking through. Uh, and the players can talk with him, and it's a really neat uh, part of the chapter when they can, but then his motivations are supposedly up to chance, and it literally some of his motivations are he just wants to kill the characters, or he could be on the other end of the spectrum and be like, he wants to help the characters. Again, I don't want to leave any of that up to just a tarot reading, and I get that you, know, you can do that to create replayability, but who the fuck is playing you know, a 40, 50 hour adventure, I don't know how long this is, you know, multiple times, like that seems insane to me, uh, you know, for Adventures League stuff that's designed, you know, short adventures that you're designed to play over and over again, that replayability is great, um, but things like this, where I think most groups are going to play through this once, I would have rather had all of those elements been tied to specific locations and been made um, more meaningful rather than the randomly generated uh, result, which is what ends up happening. It just doesn't... None of, I mean, for treasure, that's fine. Because treasure, it's not too big of a deal. But at least for the big character motivations and the death of Cecilia, um, I did not like seeing the tarot cards used here. So I didn't like the tarot cards in Strahd for that reason, and I don't like them here for that reason. I don't want to leave that stuff up to chance. But um, if you like that stuff from Strahd, then uh, City of Eyes uses that exact same mechanic with the tarot reading. That's one of the first things they can appear. Literally, the bartender is like, let me tell your fortune, because that's what bartenders do in this world. Um, the other locations are there's an infinite stair system, which is like this interdimensional teleportation network, this like super highway along the Eldritch Plain that players have to roll certain checks in order to access, and all these different areas are interconnected to each other, which is really neat, so they can kind of teleport between areas, but it's very hard to do. You have to roll some uh, strict skill checks, and then when you reach one of them, there's a temple, where there's this creepy, like, uh, what was the, uh, that, that thin man, not the thin man, there's uh, whatever that horror thing was with the tall dude you can't see it's just black um there's that kind of creepy like stalking the characters and always like you feel a hand on your shoulder and it's just oh it's so creepy there's a oh the prison with the that holds groblets um is has all these riddles that players have to decipher and the the riddles actually tell you i should go to that section it's really clever uh the riddles actually tell you how to converse with the spider god so he doesn't fucking kill you oops i've got the screenshot thing on um, let me scoot down here. There's the Crooked House. Um, there's some more random encounters, which are all fun. There's troglodytes in the toilet, just for toilet humor. Um, uh, more Crooked House. Here's the prison. Okay, chapter four. Um, and the prison has all these different areas. And then if it's tied to character personality traits, which is something I never see in D&D, but literally it's not a skill check to in order to, in order to decipher the riddle. And, well, there's no riddle. It's just a, a message. Only characters with certain personality traits get to see the words etched in Celestial, which I think... Or actually, they're different ones. Sorry, that's Thieves Can't, Celestial, Abyssal, um, all these different variations, which doesn't say if you can speak that language, you can see it. It only says uh, if you have those certain personality traits. So, for example, any character with a personality trait expressing chaos, freedom, or music can see the message scrawled in Primordial on the mirror like rocks. And then you get that kind of... Uh, uh, hint there. Any character with a personality trait related to magic or power can see words etched into the staircase. The skull will scour this world with lightning and blood will fall like rain. These are all clues on how to deal, uh, converse with the spider god as named here. So with the widow's mercy, the spider will not tolerate anyone to weep or mourn in his presence. So if you break any of these rules, then um, it says he attacks you, which... Um, at the end, he's a CR 30, like, just demigod. <laughs> it seems real, real bad if you actually uh, fall into combat with this character. It seems like a really bad idea. So as a DM, I would probably just have that character, like, I don't know, shoo the players away or something. I wouldn't actually maybe unleash them on it. That seems really nasty. Uh, but it's a really neat area and a really neat idea. It seems a little obtuse. Um... I would probably be a little more forward with trying to explain the fact that the spider has rules. And I think it even says that um, Groblitz is aware of these structures and is forced to disclose them to anyone who directly asks him a question about the matter, such as, are there rules to this conversation? So I would probably include some extra dialogue that was like, you know, I hope you follow the rules or you got the messages or something. And the player's like, oh, shit, all those things mean something? Because otherwise there's not... It's kind of obtuse with that. And 
I know a lot of DM designers want to be clever, and I get that, and I like that, but I do think there is value in being a little less clever when you're dealing with players that may not be getting the situation. Um, just be aware of that, you know, as always, general DM advice. Um, it's a really, really neat area, though. We do get maps here, but we these are not separate player maps, unfortunately. Um, and uh, it's they're not... They're they're fine, um, but again, they're not grid you know maps. I can plug into roll twenty. That's you know, and everybody uses roll twenty. That's fine too. Um, but there are maps here, which is good. Just have some kind of visualization. Um, I love this prison area though. Uh, other areas, there's that uh, creepy gaunt silhouette figure at the Temple of Infinite Stairs. Um, there's a library run by a beholder slash an oblex that creates all these like other creatures you have to deal with. Um, there's an asylum run by illithids. A, including an ultra, uh, uh, what's the, uh, Ulithid, uh, Utilithid or something, uh, the name Dr. Brains, which is great, who actually could be an ally of the NPCs, which I would totally run with that, because that's, I love using uh, monstrous uh, characters in, like, non-monstrous ways, just because I think that's really fun. Um, including, and there's also an Elder Brain there called the Disciplinary Board, which is fucking fantastic. And the disciplinary board wants Dr. Brains to start his own, like, you know, illithid colony. And so Dr. Brains is trying to escape uh, the Elysium dimension. And so he could become an ally of the players. Be like, yeah, we let's try to get out of here. And I think that would be absolutely fantastic. Um, it's also just a really good dungeon. It, it's huge. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, you know, you walk into a room and you see, like, rows and rows of thralls that the illithids have um, devoured their brains at. But they're not actually hostile to the players. Um, you know, outwardly, they they play the part of nurses. They play the part of nurses, but they still look like illithids. They've got like the tentacles and everything, and they say it's a skin condition called cerebrella or something. That's also fucking hysterical. I love it. I love everything about that. Um, there's a newspaper delivered by skeletons and coats. That's amazing. Uh, there's an auction house run by rakshasas, who uh, have a really interesting method that you um, bid something called squeams which is not money. Instead, they extract, like, vital essence out of your body. And literally, it's one of the, um, I think it's one of the mental attributes, and you choose which one, and they literally lower your attribute by, like, a point per squeam, and then you can get magical item. And there are notes about how to get each uh, magical item. They are detailed in here. Like, the details in this, uh, I mean, it's 100 pages. Like, I can't go over everything, but you get everything. Like, library encounters, there's an encounter for each of these. There's books. I mean, look at all these uh, handouts for books that you can use that they can find in the library um, I'm going to skip the asylum is a good dungeon as you can see here hopefully I don't freak my Adobe Reader out too much by skipping as I said very very long uh, quality dungeon here with the asylum very very large trying to find let's see that's the postal office uh, there's the Rakshasa so um, the auction house uh, you can see here, literally, and, and you get flavor text for every single one, so if it brings out an item. This reminds me of, like, Final Fantasy VI, when you have that auction house, and you can literally just sit and it's, like, brings out certain items that you can bid on. Um, and there's a lot here, which is really fun, and they're pretty powerful, um, but it will cost you, like, literally your base attributes, uh, or I guess you could fight the Rakshasas, which it mentions the fact that they don't really like to fight. They try to do everything they can to not fight off, uh, to fight you off. Um, there's a creepy tower that is, um, they basically take all the dead people and uh, burn them in a pyre and then use the ash to build, to bake them into bricks to build this giant tower leading up to the sky because this crazy, um, I think it's an undead person, or at least a non-living person called She Who Wails, which is a great fucking name, is obsessed with trying to escape this place by building a tower of dead bricks, dead bricks out of dead bodies, which is also awesome. Uh, literally, the entryway just has, like, 13 mummies in it or something. So the players have to just deal with that if they want to get in. There's an insane trap here involving a bunch of spinning uh, globes. Uh, what do they call the constellation? Uh, the Ori uh, a constellation. Dangerous and piece of technology. Levitating colored orbs with internal clockwork ticking away inside them. And they all do terrible things to you. It's one of those traps that works on initiative order. So it's just a fucking doomsday room. So much good stuff here. Um... Yeah, there's a great tavern which has you know every room is just something fucked up you just open a door and it's just there's something crazy going on in there which I love um, it eventually leads to um, the goal is to get to the lake in the middle of the city the whole city has a water theme to it which is very common with uh, Cthulhu Eldritch Horror stuff um, 
and you need to get to the bottom of the lake, which obviously has difficulty there. And it even has this like water tracking depth thing. Like even if you find a way to breathe underwater, you'll take the depth thing. Uh, you can buy an amulet, uh, the amulet, the uh, apparatus of Qualish, which I think is like literally a submarine. Um, but you take the depth damage, even you know if you can breathe underwater. Uh, the only disappointing thing is that that undercity, which is there's a mirror city under the water, which is cool, uh, like on the other side, there's almost nothing there, which is really disappointing. You just you go around to like two different uh, places. Oh, here we go. Is the it says the distance, uh, and then here's the underground. So you can see there's not nearly as many um, sites. It just feels like you know if this was a video game, I'd complain that like funding ran out because they didn't quite finish the final area. That's kind of what this feels like, uh, and I hate to complain because there's so much good content leading up to this. The entire city of Elysium is f amazing with tons of really fun areas and interesting things going on. That when I came to this chapter 12 of the Undercity. Uh, I was really disappointed with how um, generally um, just under construction it feels like. There's just nothing going on. I was expecting like a really fucked up version of all the other things, and there's really not. You can see the Crooked House is just destroyed, and that's about it. There's an Abolith living somewhere. And then the point is to go to the very middle. Uh, you can see the, and this is not an error, by the way, the, um, the actual uh, PDF gets darker as you go down, which is really clever, until you get to the actual finale is literally like pitch black with uh, white text, which that is, you know, something only the DM is going to see, but it's a really clever and smart uh, way to make the uh, actual reading of the text and the adventure more engaging for the DM. Uh, the final boss is the heart of the city, which is this um, evil mirror um, because he's been sealed away by the, uh, the former gods of Elysium. Uh, there were 13 gods, but only 12 of them decided to seal uh, the evil away. The third one is that Groblitz, that spider god that, that kind of ran away. So um, this is similar to how the uh, Oliver did his, uh, the other adventure, uh, Widow's Peak, where the players have a choice between a uh, kind of what to do at the end. Although in this case, it really matters on how well they're able to convince that Groblitz character to help them. And again, I wouldn't want to leave like his motivation up to chance. I really want to work with the players to... Uh, you know, make sure, because ultimately, as the god in question, Groblitz is the one that's supposed to seal the evil away. Or the characters could just try to defeat the evil and then maybe destroy it for good would be the other way to do it. Um, but clearly, I don't think they're meant to fight Groblitz because he's a fucking CR30 demigod of in crazy stats. Um, this already seems like it's a pretty fun fight. It does mention it's very, very hard. And again, I don't know. Just looking at this, I have no way of knowing how balanced this stuff is, and I have no experience with you know 15th level adventures, tier three, so or maybe even tier four at that point. So I'm not sure. It does mention if they've um, helped Cecilia, which it just says I think yeah. If you dis if you discover what befell Cecilia and informed her mother, then um, I guess her spirit appears and get and gives you some buffs, which that part's kind of nice. But that's like the only goal of what was really the main quest, which was to find out what happened to Cecilia. And it just turns out that the main goal actually becomes, oh, just get to the bottom of the Lake City and fight the heart. So I wish there was a little more, um, I hate to think of a little more linearity to the story. I wish I wish it was Cecilia that ended up, you know, you do like find Cecilia somewhere and can talk to her and maybe rescue her. Um, and, you know, I think it sucks that you just end up finding her, discovering her grisly demise at some point. Um, and maybe if she was like one of the gods or something that was that was beseeching the characters and maybe she had forgotten who she was. You know, something clever there is what I was expecting and I was ultimately kind of disappointed. It's not going to be a con, but I was just a little disappointed in, in the fact that Cecilia was just this dead person that can kind of give you a buff at the end, considering that's kind of the main story. Uh, it turns out Groblitz is more of the main story. Um, and he can uh, appear at the end and hopefully help the characters or maybe the characters will beseech his help. Um... But it's it's a really, really good adventure. There's a lot going on. It's written in a really fun style that uh, totally speaks to the theme of an Eldritch Horror or Ravenloft adventure. Um, very, very well done in that regard. And as I mentioned, as you can see here, there's just a crap ton of content. I was flabbergasted, honestly, by just how uh, long and detailed all of these bits are any one of these individual chapters frankly could almost be big enough for its own dm guild release like i'm being serious like it's you know all those dungeons and everything that's there's almost enough there in each of those to make its own adventure the fact that all of these are together for one giant adventure like is this how you make a tier four adventure because i would think that like yes that's that's probably worth 
that's that's probably how you do it. Like you need something that's big and epic for characters of that level. And I think um, putting them in this kind of creepy, uh, extra dimensional nightmare as literally the clock is ticking and they have to go to all these horrible things uh, is probably the right way to do it. Um, And then at the end, it even goes beyond, above and beyond in providing even more things. Uh, You get character backgrounds specific to this adventure. You get a character race. You can play as an Elysian. Uh, You get a wild magic table. You get, uh, this is the actual tarot deck uh, information. So again, if you wanted to use that tarot deck, there's all the randomly generated um, uh, locations. There is flavor text for every single one of those for whoever is doing the tarot reading to actually say those. Every single one of those. That's that's a lot. And you get all these uh, uh, named NPCs, the Dr. Brains, there's a Cheshire Cat, of course, classic that can appear in different places and kind of mess with the players. They'll also give them advice. Um, where is the, there's Groblets, CR 30, 600 hit points, AC of 25, legendary actions, multi-attack of three attacks, it's, it's real big and bad, I don't want, I don't think you want to fight that thing, um, lots of treasures, I'm just scrolling through, because there's just so much here, uh, a specific madness table, <laughs> <laughs> There's the map of the infinite stairs, which leads to all you can teleport around. Certain, uh, the magic can replace some of the other um, spells that you have. Holy crap. There's a lot here, and it's all really, really good. I have very few uh, complaints about story or structure. I think there's like one or two paragraphs that repeated themselves erroneously. But honestly, when you have 100 pages, I'm going to be real fucking um, merciful on any kind of uh, grammatical or editing errors. And frankly, there were. Uh, no grammatical or editing errors that I could see at, at whatsoever, except for in a couple places there were um, small paragraphs that were repeated, or like the Cheshire's cat, one of his things were in the wrong uh, place. But honestly, it's really, really well put together. I was incredibly impressed. Uh, let's go over my quick pros and cons for the City of Eyes. Trying to go all the way back up. I've never had to scroll so much. There we go. Um, pro, over 100 pages of excellent world building and storytelling in the gothic horror world of Elysium. Uh, absolutely fantastic. The writing level is fun for DMs and fun for the part that you read aloud to players. It's all very, very well written. There's a lot of detail about Elysium that I feel like I can fully immerse myself and my players into this um, very thematic uh, noir, you know, rain falling creatures shuffling over in the dark just all of that is beautifully done uh pro the city provides an open world flavor set within a structured environment full of flavorful random encounters and detailed locations and i really really like um that method of doing a DD campaign which is how uh, strahd is done that's kind of how tomb of annihilation is done which is give the players an open world but limit that world to very strict uh you know a walled off area um because as a DM, I just don't want to have to have my players go completely off the rails and uh, be lost on prep work. But give them, you know, give them just enough rope to hang themselves on. Basically, let them explore a little bit. In the case of uh, Elysium, there's enough locations here to where you can give them a map of a city and have literally eight named locations they can visit, and they still feel like they have all that freedom to explore on their own as well as have random encounters, whereas the DM has enough information to, you know, obviously be able to have all those areas prepped and ready to go. So I think it's a really good balance. Uh, Pro, detailed notes on everything a DM could want to run this adventure from uh, possible books in the library to rumors about Elysium uh, and secrets and every single magical item up for bid at the auction house. Just the fact that all that information is here, all of it is given like player read flavor text uh, is just really above and beyond, and I vastly appreciate all of that and very impressed by that. And pro, custom trinket table, wild magic table, player race, and backgrounds to be used specifically for this adventure. The appendix uh, is full of just extra goodies as if we needed even more content. It's fantastic. Cons, I don't like the tarot card reading. It's it's done well here. Like it, There's a lot of information given, and it's detailed, and that's great. I just don't like it used as a storytelling device, period. I did not like it in Curse of Strahd, and I don't like it here. Now, that's, you know, as as a DM, what I would do is figure out which ones I like the best and then do the tarot reading 
well, you know, I can do this on roll 20 easily, but, you know, or make sure, oh, I wouldn't even do as a terror rating, but just do as like a flavorful, like, you know, role playing dialogue thing and just say, okay, here's where the shit is um, based on what I think would work the best. And maybe that's me taking too much control, but I really, I don't, I think it's a silly idea to try to create more replayability out of a module that's so big and, and involved and you really only play it once. Um, which isn't a knock, knock against it. I think that means it's, it's really good. It means it's not like a you know roguelike dungeon crawler. It's a really good, lengthy RPG. Um, if you like that kind of thing, that's fine. I'm just not a fan of it at all, so that was a con for me. Um, con, the underwater mirror town of Undercity, which serves as the climactic final act, is just disappointingly bare and limited in scope. I was really kind of shocked to see that. Um, it just kind of peters out in the end. Uh, I mean, it still feels like there's a there's a, a nice climax at the end, but I just thought that the whole Undercity part of it was basically just an excuse to get down there and fight the boss. It wasn't a really full-blown developed area that I expected. Uh, and then to tie up with that, I was kind of disappointed with how the Cecilia plot thread just ends very, very anticlimactically, and it just ends up being a buff for the players if they find, like, how she died at the end without really learning anything beyond, you know, it turns out the main quest was just that you needed to explore the bottom of the lake and fight the heart uh and then uh just a con and this really goes for me as somebody that plays on roll 20 there are no separate player maps uh for the dungeons which is a bummer everything is just that uh embedded annotated map style but don't let that dissuade you because it's a fantastic adventure final verdict uh featuring an absolutely staggering amount of content and phenomenal world building the city of eyes weaves a memorable high level urban horror adventure thank you to everyone for watching this video review you can see my written review at roguewatson.com you can support my work at patreon.com slash roguewatson and you can follow our own D, D adventures here on my youtube channel thank you